the truth, dharma. As people who have struggled with addiction, we're already into. Dash. Mainly familiar with the truth of suffering. Even if we've never heard of. The Buddha, at some level we already understand the core of the teach. Dash. Ings. That in this life, there is suffering. It can be incredibly liberating to hear this said so plainly and directly. No one is trying to convince or convert us. No one is telling us. We have to believe something. No one is sugarcoating our experience. The Buddha also taught the way to free ourselves from this sooth. Dash. Faring. When the Buddha awakened, he understood how samsara, or the cycle of existence, came to be and how it is maintained. The heart of these teachings which we call the Dharma is the Four Noble Truths. These Four Truths and the corresponding commitments are the foundation of our program. 1. There is suffering. We commit to understanding the truth of suffering. 2. There is a cause of suffering. We commit to understanding that craving leads to suffering. 3. There is a way of ending suffering. We commit to understanding and experiencing that less craving leads to less suffering. 4. There is a path that leads to ending suffering. We commit to Kalti, Dash, that in the path. Like a map that shows us the path, these truths help us find our way in recovery. The first noble truth. There is suffering. Some of the ways in which we may experience suffering are obvi. Dash. Else, like poverty, hunger, pain, disappointment, and feeling separated or excluded. There is also suffering due to the divisions of our world, such as war, colonization, and oppression. Some are less obvious, like feelings of cravings, anxiety, stress, and uncertainty. We also suffer as we struggle with birth, aging, sickness, and death. As much as we want to avoid what we consider unpleasant and hold on to what we label as pleasant, dissidus, dash, faction, separation, loss, and injustice still may frequently arise. Suffering occurs whenever we fail to see the true nature of our existence, when we insist on controlling or altering our reality. The first noble truth rests on the understanding that our lives seem unsatisfactory because experiences are impermanent and imperson. Dash. Al. Our senses which the Buddha understood to include not just hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touch, but also thinking, are often unruly. Dash. Able and temporary, which means that the way we experience and make sense of the world is constantly changing and subjective. We suffer the dash, cause we keep expecting these temporary experiences to be permanent and absolute, and to satisfy our craving for pleasure or to avoid pain. Many of us have suffered by trying and failing to control our dependencies, habits, and addictions. We've used every kind of willpower, dash, or bargaining, planning, and magical thinking, each time imagining the result would be different, and blaming ourselves when it turned out the same. How many times did we promise, just this one last time, then, I'm done, 
I'll just use a drink on the weekends, or only after work, or only on special occasions. I'll never drink in the morning. I won't do the hard stuff. I'll never get high alone. I'll never use at work or around my family. I'll never drink and drive. I'll never use needles. How many diets have we tried? How many times have we said? We wouldn't binge, or purge, or restrict calories, or over-exercise. How many times have we looked at the scars on our arms and vowed to never cut again? How many times have we let our wounds heal, only to break them open once more? How many limits have we set on ourselves around technology or work, only to get pulled back in? How many times have we vowed to have no more one-night stands, vowed to stay away from certain people or places or websites? How many times have we crossed our own boundaries and been consumed by shame? How many mornings did we wake up hating ourselves, vowing to never do again what we did last night, only to find ourselves repeat, dash, in the same mistake again just a few hours later? How many times did we attempt to cure our addictions with therapy, self-help books, cleanses, more exercise, or by changing a job? Or relationship, how many times did we move, thinking our shadow wouldn't follow us? How many promises did we make? How many times did we break those promises? Having suffered and struggled with addiction in its many forms, We've come to understand this first truth as it relates to Rekav. Dash. Bori. Addiction. Is. Suffering. We suffer when we obsess, when we cling. And grasp onto all of the delusions of addiction, all the impermanent. Solutions to our discomfort and pain. We've tried to cure our suffering. By using the very substances and behaviors that create more discomfort and pain, all our attempts to control our habits demonstrate how we've been clinging to the illusion that we can somehow control our expiry. Dash. Answers of the world are how others have treated us. We're still trapped in the prison of suffering. In fact, we're reinforcing its walls every time we act on our addictions. Liberation comes when we gain a clear understanding of where our real power lies, and when we are throwing it away. This is a program of empowerment. It's a path of letting go of behavior that no longer serves us in cultivating that which does. Trauma and Attachment Injury Many of us have experienced trauma, often described as the psi dash chological damage that occurs after living through an extremely fright dash any more distressing event or situation. For some of us, this trauma can be a long-term experience. It's caused by an overwhelming amount of Stress that exceeds our ability to cope, and may make it hard to function. Even long after the event, trauma can come from childhood experiencing dash, s or from events that occur in our adulthood. It can be sudden, or it can develop over time from a series of events that changed how we per dash, see ourselves in the world. This also includes the resulting trauma from discrimination and bigotry. While trauma frequently comes from 
life-threatening events, any situation that leaves one feeling emotionally or physically in danger can be traumatic. It's not the objective facts of the event that define the trauma, the stress is relative and what might be considered traumatic for one may not be for others. Generally, the more terror and helplessness we feel, the more likely it is we'll be traumatized. Attachment injury can be just as insidious and harmful as trow, dash, na, and can have the same impact. It's defined as an emotional wound to a core relationship with a caregiver, often caused by abuse, neglect, or inconsistency of care in early childhood. Trauma and attachment injury can impact our recovery and meditation practice in slightly different ways. With trauma we may feel fear even panic or distrust when asked to sit in meditation even when intellectually we know we're in a safe place with a supportive group. It may be triggering to be asked to be present in our bodies and minds, or to focus on our breath. It might also feel unsafe when your identity is uniquely different from the majority of the Sangha. Attachment injury may show up as a hesitation to trust people, or a process, as a reluctance to be part of a recovery group or Sangha, or as a core belief that we don't belong. In this case, the nurturing thing to do for ourselves might be to lean into this discomfort compassionately, engage, and investigate the stories we're telling ourselves about not be. Dash. Learning. Again, it's key to become aware of the nature of the harm we carry with us. Trauma and attachment injury may require different ways of feeling safe and supported. You should always do whatever is most compassionate for yourself in the moment and seek outside help when you need it. Trauma and attachment issues are relevant to suffering and add dash diction because they can have a huge impact on our mental and physical health. Studies show that those who struggle with addiction have often experienced trauma at some point in their lives. What we try and use to make us feel better, whether it's substances or behaviors, often only reinforces the cycle of aversion and craving that will lead to more soof. Dash. Faring. The brain can be overactive when trauma is present because it perceives a very real threat, and the body often responds with feelings of helplessness, fear, and vulnerability. This system can be easily thrown into overdrive when one's life experience screams, you're not safe. Danger. Danger. Even when the danger is no longer present. For some people, post-traumatic symptoms may be increasingly severe and last long after the original events have ended. Many of us have intrusive thoughts that seem to come out of the blue, or we feel confusion, or mood swings we can't link to specific events. Traumatic responses may lead us to avoid activities or places that trigger memories of the event. We can become socially isolated and withdrawn, and lose interest in things we used to enjoy. Post-traumatic stress disorder PTSD, may cause us to be easily startled, edgy, have impaired function during sex or other activities, or unusually alert to potential danger. Overwhelming fear, anxiety, detachment and isolation, shame, 
and anger may become background states of our activities. Many other effects of trauma may be triggered by social interactions, work, or metadata. Dash. Tion, areas that may be completely disconnected from the original events. Race-based trauma, as well as trauma from any experience of discrimination or bigotry, can accumulate over a lifetime. When these incidents are considered separately, they might appear manageable, but when experienced cumulatively, they can become extremely difficult to cope with the distress, fear, and physical body responses that may arise. From this kind of trauma often overlap with the symptoms of PTSD. Trauma and attachment injury can lead to the fear, anger, angst, dash, IAT, guilt, and loneliness that are common responses to various life X, dash, experiences. But, at a deeper level, trauma makes it harder for us to cope. In general, to form healthy or safe relationships, to develop an identity in the world, or to defend ourselves. No two of us will react to the same experience in the same way, but this truth points to the fact that certain past experiences can affect our responses later in life. This is key to under dash standing dukkha, and to meeting our experience with wise boundaries. Compassion, kindness, and courage rather than judgment for others and ourselves which is an essential part of recovery. Many of us turn to addictive substances and behaviors as a way to cope with our trauma, sometimes running from the pain of our Experiences by way of our addictions was itself a survival technique from feeling that we wouldn't be able to live through the pain of our memories. While this may have provided some temporary relief, it did nothing to actually heal the pain of our trauma, and often led to even more pain. Our trauma is not our fault, but healing from it is our response C. Dash. Ability, and our right. Developing understanding and compassion toward. The way trauma affects our reactions to events or circumstances in the. Present moment is an important part of that healing. Inquiry of the first noble truth. Colon. Begin by making a list of the behaviors and actions associated with your addictions that you consider harmful. Without exaggerating or minimizing, think about the things you have done that have pre dash aided additional suffering to yourself and others. For each behavior listed, write how you and others have suffered because of that behavior. List any other costs or negative consequences you can think of, such as finances, health, relationships, sexual relations, or missed opera. Dash. Tunities. Do you notice any patterns? What are they? What are the ways that you might avoid or reduce suffering for yourself and others if you change these patterns. How have your addictive behaviors been a response to trauma and pain? What are some ways you can respond to trauma and pain that nurture healing rather than avoidance? If you have experienced trauma from discrimination, what are ways you can experience healing and practice self-care. Consider opera. Dash. Tunities to support social justice while allowing yourself to heal in. Practice compassion for yourself and others. The second noble truth. 
the cause of suffering. As people who have become dependent on substances and be dash behaviors, we've all experienced the sense of failure and hopelessness that comes from trying and failing to let go of our fixations. Addiction itself increases our suffering by creating a hope that both pleasure and escape can be permanent. We go through this suffering again and again because substances or behaviors can only give us temporary relief to our pain, our unhappiness, and our lost or damaged sense of self. Our refusal to accept the way things are leads to wanting, or craft, dash, in, which is the cause of suffering. This excludes discrimination based suffering and harm which do not need to be accepted, but met with wise boundaries, wise action, and compassion. We don't suffer because of the way things are, but because we want, or think we, need those things to be different. We suffer because we cling to the idea that we can satisfy our own cravings, while ignoring the true nature of the world around us. Above all, we cling to the idea that we can hold on to impermanent and unreliable things, things that can't ever lead to real sat. Dash. Is faction or lasting happiness, without experiencing the suffering of one day losing them. Clinging to impermanent solutions for suffering results in crav. Dash. In. We experience craving like a thirst, an unsatisfied longing, and it can become a driving force in our lives. If craving goes beyond simple desire, which is a natural part of life, it often leads us to fixation, obsession, and the delusional belief that we can't be happy without getting what we crave. It warps our intentions so that we make choices that harm our dash selves and others. This repetitive craving and obsessive drive to satisfy it leads to what we now know as addiction. Addiction occupies the part of our mind that chooses our will and replaces compassion, kindness, generosity, honesty, and other intentions that might have been there. Many of us experience addiction as the loss of our freedom to choose, it's the addiction that seems to be making our choices for us in the way we must have food, shelter, or water, our mind can tell us we must have some substance, buy or steal something, satisfy some lust, keep acting until we achieve some needed result that we must protect ourselves at all cost and attack people with whom we dis dash agree, are people who have something we want. This, need, also leads to an unsettled or agitated state of mind that tells us we'll only be happy if we get certain results or feel a certain way. We want to be someone we're not, or we don't want to be who we are. Conditions or circumstances in and of themselves don't cause suffering, they can cause pain or unpleasant experiences, but we add suffering on top of this when we think we need those circumstances to be different. We create even more suffering when we act out in ways that deny the reality of the circumstances and the reality of impermanence. Craving is the underlying motive that fuels unwise actions that create suffering. Inquiry of the Second Noble Truth. Colon. List situations, 
circumstances and feelings that you have used harm. Dash. Full behavior to try to avoid. Name the emotions, sensations, and thoughts that come to mind. When you abstain, are there troubling memories, shame, grief, or unmet needs behind the craving? How can you meet these with calm? Dash. Passion and patience. What things did you give up in your clinging to impermanent and unreliable solutions? For example, did you give up relationships? Phi. Dash. Financial security, health, opportunities, legal standing, or whether I am. Dash. Important things to maintain your addictive behaviors. What made the addiction more important to you than any of these things you gave? Up. Are you clinging to any beliefs that fuel craving and aversion? Beliefs that deny the truth of impermanence are beliefs about how things in life should be. What are they? If you have experienced discrimination-based trauma or social injuries, dash, ties, how can you meet the experience in a way that honors your true self without creating more pain and suffering? The third noble truth, ending the suffering. It is possible to end our suffering when we come to understand the nature of our craving and realize that all our experiences are tempo. Dash. Wary by nature, we can begin a more skillful way to live with the disit. Dash. Is faction that is part of being human. We don't need to be torn apart by our thoughts and feelings that say, I have to have more of that, or all. Do anything to get rid of this. The third noble truth states that the end of craving is possible. Each of us has the capacity for recovery. We are responsible for our own actions and for the energy we give our thoughts and feelings. This means we have some control over how we respond to our own suffering because the unpleasant emotions take place within us, we create them through our response to experience. We don't need to depend on anyone or anything else to remove the causes of our suffering. We may not be able to control anything out there, but we can learn to choose what we think, say, and do. We come to under dash Stand that if our thoughts, words, and actions are driven by greed, hatred, or confusion, we are creating suffering within suffering. If we let go of these attitudes, we can lessen suffering and even create freedom. We can choose to give up these causes of disturbing and unpleasant emotions. This is the true empowerment and freedom of recovery, recognizing that happiness and suffering are up to us, based on how we choose to respond to our experiences. Inquiry of the Third Noble Truth colon. What makes it so hard to quit? What resources are available to help you abstain and recover? List reasons to believe you can recover. Also list your doubts. What? Make the wise and compassionate part of you, your Buddha Na. Dash. To Ray. Say about these doubts. Practice. Letting go. Of something small. Notice that the craving. Doesn't last and that there's a little sense of relief when you let it pass. That's a little taste of freedom. The fourth noble truth. The path. The Buddha taught that by living ethically, practicing metta. Dash. 
Tian, in developing wisdom and compassion, we can end the suffering. We create by resisting, running from, and misunderstanding reality. The fourth noble truth is the path that summarizes the S. Dash. Sential elements to recovery, or awakening, and leads to the ending of suffering. It provides an instructive practice for investigating and become dash. In aware of the conditioned responses we cling to. These are the eight factors of the path. 1. Wise understanding. 2. Wise intention. 3. Wise speech. 4. Wise action. 5. Wise livelihood. 6. Wise effort. 7. Wise mindfulness. 8. Wise concentration. These eight factors can be divided into three groups. The wisdom group of understanding and intention. The ethics group of speech, action, and livelihood. The concentration group of effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Each of us will understand and practice each aspect of this eightfold path in our own way. We develop our wisdom, ethical practice, and concentration as far as we can in any given moment. As we come to a deeper understanding of the Four Noble Truths, we're able to bring more effort and concentration to letting go of our greed, hatred, and confusion. Our ethical development will cause us to reflect more deeply on these sources of our unwise actions. The Eightfold Path is a way of life that each of us follows in practices to the best of our current understanding and capacity. The path can serve as both a religious and non-religious journey. For many people, their Buddhist practice includes prayer, worship, and ceremony. It is up to you to decide whether to include these practices as part of your recovery path. Inquiry of the Fourth Noble Truth colon. Understanding that recovery and the ending of suffering is possible. What is your path to recovery and ending the suffering of addiction? Be honest about the challenges you might face, and the tools and resources you will use to meet those challenges. What behaviors can you change to more fully support your recovery? What does it mean to you to take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha for your recovery? The Eightfold Path We've found that it's useful to make inquiry and investigation a normal part of our everyday routine, especially when we're feeling un- dash. Comfortable emotions are facing tough decisions. We can take a moment to pause and sit with what we're experiencing, identify it, and simply allow it to be, with compassion and without judgment. Then use the Eightfold Path as a guide to go inward and forward by asking ourselves, How can I apply the Eightfold Path? It can also be beneficial to use the different sections of the Eightfold Path as an end-of-day reflection. Wise Understanding As we engage in the world, rather than withdraw from it, we can use wise understanding to live without clinging, attachment, or craving. By paying attention to our actions and the results of those actions, we can begin to change where our choices are leading. If we intend to act in ways that have positive results, and if we're aware of the true intention and the nature of our actions, then we'll see better results, better meaning less 
suffering and less harm. The word, karma, in Sanskrit translates to, what are actions free? Dash. 8. Any intentional act, mental, verbal, or physical, is a kind of karma. Skillful or wise actions strengthen our sense of balance, kindness, compassion, loving, and equanimity. When we act unskillfully or run, dash, wisely, when we steal, lie, take advantage of somebody else, or cause, intentional harm based on our own craving or delusions, it creates an immediate sense of imbalance. It fights with our intention to avoid harming others. Karma is determined by our intention and applies to any volitional or purposeful action. The result of our volitional actions may be an increase in our happiness or may lead to additional suffering. There is no actor apart from action, and there is no action without intention. Unskillful actions leave us less able to meet the next challenge or pain we face. For example, when we steal, we have to immediately justify to ourselves why our greed was more important than the harm we caused. By taking, we must create a cover story, hide our actions, and adjust to the fear of getting caught. Ultimately, if the theft gets discovered, we might have to deal with financial or legal consequences, or face a lack of trust from our community. Similarly, when we're dishonest, we immediately focus energy on maintaining the untruth. We must emotionally carry the potential pain that is caused to others, and ourselves, if the lie is revealed. This understanding of karma rests on the insight that we are responsible for our own happiness and misery, and there is a cause to every experience of happiness or misery. From a Buddhist point of view, our choices, which are dependent on our present mental, moral, and dash, intellectual, and emotional conditions, decide the effects of our actions. If we act skillfully, with understanding and compassion, it's possible to cause positive, beneficial effects for ourselves and others. If we act with unskillful intention, we cause our own suffering. This doesn't mean that we always have control over our XP. Dash. Ryan says, no matter how skillfully we act, the external world, people, places, things, societal structures, might not give us what we want. This does not mean we have bad karma or that we failed. It just means that we're not in control of everything and everyone. The point is that, regardless of what the outside world throws at us, we're responsible for how we respond to it and how we tend to our internal world. At the end of the day, we have the choice whether we go to bed as some dash body who acted wisely and compassionately, or as somebody who didn't. It's important to note that being responsible for our own half dash Pines and suffering doesn't mean we're responsible for pain inflicted on us by others, or by circumstances out of our control. Many of us have experiences of victimization, oppression, and trauma through no fault of our own. The pain from these experiences should be met with compass. Dash. Scion, understanding, and wise boundaries, not minimized, invalidated. 
were pushed away. In recovery, we learn that we don't have to add an extra layer of suffering to this pain. We can begin to heal rather than let these experiences or the action of others control and limit us. Without this dash, counting or ignoring the ongoing effects of trauma in our lives, we begin to understand that our responses when that trauma comes up for us can change our experience of suffering and happiness. The Buddhist perspective is that our present mental, moral, and dash, intellectual, and emotional circumstances are the direct result of our AC dash, tions and habits, both past and present. How we choose to respond when confronted with pain or discomfort will change our ability to skillfully deal with suffering when it arises. We can also take solace in the fact that we're not alone, that every person has difficult and unpleasant experience. Dash. S. It's how we respond to pain that determines our experience. Inquiry of wise understanding. Think of a situation in your life that is causing confusion and run. Dash. Ease. Run. What is the truth of this situation? 2. Are you seeing clearly, or are you getting lost in judgment? Taking things personally in stories you're telling yourself, or repeating past messages you've internalized. How? 3. Is your vision clouded by greed, hatred, confusion, clinging? Attachment, or craving, how? In what situations and parts of your life do you have the most defeat? Dash. Culty separating wants from needs. Are there areas or relationships where the drive to get what you desire overshadows any other concept? Dash. Oration. Has this changed since you began or continue in recovery? Are there parts of your life where you are driven to continue on please? Dash. And experiences because you think you must or need to. How is karma, the law of cause and effect, showing up right now? Where in your life are you dealing with the effects or aftermath of? Action you took in the past, both positive and negative. Wise intention. Wise intention describes the attitude or approach we take to. Dash. Ward ourselves in the world. We can choose non-harming by avoiding. Actions that have harmful results, detaching from the cravings that seem. Overwhelming in the moment and developing a kind and compassionate stance toward ourselves and the world. Wise intention leads us to stop doing things based on confusion, ill will, hatred, violence, and selfish. Dash. Mess. It impacts all our relationships with ourselves, other people, our community, and the world as a whole. Wise intention is deciding to act in ways that produce good car. Dash. Gnaw and to avoid actions that produce bad karma. We start by looking at the kinds of thoughts that cause us to act in wise or unwise ways. If our thoughts are based on confusion, fear, and greed, then our actions will bring bad results and create harm. If our thoughts are based on generos, dash, ity, compassion, and avoiding clinging, then our actions will bring good results. Thoughts that are based in loving kindness and goodwill, that are free from the desire or intention to cause harm, led us to act in a 
beneficial manner. There may be times when we don't necessarily want to act in a beneficial manner. We may know the right thing to do, but just don't want to do it. It's in these moments we can focus on our intention. May, dash, be we aren't ready to do the difficult thing, to quit a certain behavior, to set a boundary, or forgive someone for whom we hold a resentment. But we can set the intention to do so, and investigate our willingness in meditation by repeating statements like, May I have the willingness to forgive. May I have the willingness to quit smoking or skip that piece of cake or stay off the internet tonight, etc. Ellipsis dot. May I have the willing dash mess to make amends to my partner. The first choice we can make in wise intention is that of generosity dot. Generosity teaches us how to let go of our self-centeredness. To let go of clinging to ideas of mine and me. Selfishness or self-centeredness is one of the ways we justify and cling to our addictive behaviors. Generosity comes from the awareness that we're holding on too tightly to our selfishness. The karmic result of looking at the world only through the lens of me and mine and what I want leads to loneliness, sipa, dash, ration, and dissatisfaction. Letting go of this clinging can be the solution. Letting go of me and mine does not mean you need to stop acting. Dash. Edging your social identities within your community. Without generosity, the mind is confined to a small, tight space. Anything that's not about me and mine is off limits. At times in our lives when we become dependent, our world becomes focused on sat. Dash. Is fine our cravings, on holding on to what we want right now. We get sucked into the reactivity of survival mode, believing that we must have our addictive substance or behavior to survive. Our needs for relief or pleasure consume us, and we become blind to the needs of those around us. We may even begin to see them as threats. We can break out of this cycle by opening our hearts, by being present for, and in service to other people. Generosity allows space to re- dash- spawn to those around us, to include their well-being in our choices. This can, of course, be a tricky concept for those of us who struggle with issues of codependency. Generosity does not mean giving of ourselves without boundaries until we are depleted. It does not mean using helping as a form of manipulation to get what we want. Again, what's important here is that we're honest about the intention behind our actions. We try not to confuse intent with impact. Our intention may be to not harm, but sometimes the impact is that someone feels hurt. Many of us have experienced this in our addictions. Without intending to, and often without even being aware of it, we've created harm in other people's lives. The way we choose to practice compassion in recovery is by being accountable when our actions hurt someone, and by acknowl. Dash. Edging this hurt without blame or shame, defensiveness or justification. 
This includes when we offend someone by inadvertently using unwise speech or actions in regards to their social identity, such as race or gender. In these moments, it is important to recognize the difference between intent and impact, and having a deep appreciation and compassion for the interconnectedness among us all. Generosity allows us to cultivate appreciative joy, which is first of the four heart practices of Buddhism, along with compassion, love, dash, in kindness, and equanimity. Joyful appreciation is simply being happy. Dash. Py when somebody else has good fortune, happiness, and peacefulness. Generosity lets us appreciate the happiness of others rather than having feelings of envy, jealousy, or wanting them to be just a bit less happy so. We seem a little happier by comparison. We want the other person's hap. Dash. Pines to increase, for them to become more at peace, and so we learn to appreciate those things in their lives. In the moment of giving, of Jenner. Dash. Ozati, we've let go of self-centered desire and grasping what is mine, or what brings me pleasure. We're giving up any ill will or aversion we feel toward the person and toward the world. Instead of creating separation and withdrawal, we're actively fostering appreciation for the closeness and connectedness of the world. This is a joy that's not obstructed by selfish desires, envy, or re dash sentiment. It's the purity of happiness for someone else's good fortune. We can choose to cultivate this feeling of joy in the happiness and success of others, without the need to compete or compare. It's actually a feeling that's natural to humans, but it's often neglected when our attention is focused on selfish craving. This is the true seed of generosity delighting in the happiness of others, without needing anything in return. The second heart practice is compassion, which is first of all a will, dash, is to come close to pain, to recognize it, honor it, acknowledge it, and respond to it wisely. This isn't easy, because just as we want to run, from or suppress our own pain, we also want to avoid being with the pain of others. Compassion means sitting with our own pain and that of others. It stops the cruelty of indifference. Compassion for ourselves is crucial. Self-compassion is the key to healing the shame and guilt that we often feel as we begin to recognize the harms we caused through our addictions. We may also find that compassion is difficult to realize when it comes to those who have caused you great harm. In these cases, it can be helpful to focus on your own healing by practicing self-compassion. Engaging in wise reflection of the Four Noble Truths, and committing to the practices of the path. With time, you may gradually wish for the relief of suffering for those who have hurt you. Compassion is not just offering sympathy and a helping hand. It's also an intention to avoid causing harm to others and ourselves. This is where we can most easily see the difference between skillful and un dash skillful actions and between wise and unwise intentions cruelty and all the harm it creates in the world comes from a lack of compassion cruelty is a desire to cause pain 
Compassion is caring about the welfare and happiness of others. Compassion rests on the renunciation of harm. Dash. In living beings and is not only the wish, but also the intention to put an end to their suffering. We need to open our hearts, not just our minds, to all the suffering that is experienced in the world. Compassion is not only a feeling, it is an action. The third heart practice is loving kindness, also known as Meta. Dot. These are thoughts that are free from ill will, simply wishing that some dash body else be happy, that they be well, and free from suffering. It's the choice to consider the well-being of everyone in how we interact with the world. Meta isn't conditional. It isn't something we offer only to people. We like, we can have concern and care even when we're feeling our own pain. We can bring meta to mind when we're faced with difficulty or torn by conflicting feelings about the conditions of life at the moment. Meta doesn't depend on people acting in a certain way, on our feeling a certain way in the moment, or on the result of our caring. It frees us from only caring about the well-being of others when we think it will lead to some outcome. With Meta, we don't ask the question, will it do any good to care about this person's well-being? This means that how we think about another person isn't based on their behavior, or even on the other person at all. How we think about a person is up to us, and if it's shaped by the practice of Metta, then we can care about every person's well-being, even the most difficult and unpleasant people we know. We can honestly hope that everyone finds a way to be happy without causing harm. Wishing this goodwill towards Others frees us from the reactivity and anger that can come when we focus on the person's behavior or what we think they ought to do. We can begin to see the suffering and pain that somebody experiences as a result of their actions and care about that pain even if it might also lead to pain for us or for others. Our wish is that all beings are free from pain and suffering, that they escape hatred and fear, that they are at ease, and that they find happiness. Generosity, compassion, and loving kindness make forgiveness not only possible, but also essential for recovery. Forgiveness rests on understanding and caring about the pain and confusion that give rise to actions that we experience as harmful. We forgive when we focus on the person, rather than the action. We forgive only in the present when our hurt and anger make us aware that our resentment is blocking our uncompassionate and generous responses. Forgiveness is not so much something we are giving to the person who hurt us, but something we give to ourselves. It's centered more on our own conscious intention in how we choose to respond to them. Just as we sometimes act out of fear, greed, or confusion, we see that others do too. Forgiveness doesn't mean we accept or tolerate harm. It comes from understanding and accepting that the person causing us harm is doing so from a place of pain and con. Dash. Fusion. We extend compassion and goodwill to that person, even as we actively try to end the harm. This may mean creating safe boundaries or 
removing ourselves from exposure to harm. But we do this from a place of compassion and understanding, not resentment. It is essential that we extend the healing of forgiveness and calm. Pass into ourselves. Forgiveness allows us to let go of the guilt and shame of our own harmful actions. We remember that compassion is an action. So when we forgive ourselves we also set an intention not to recreate or continue the harm we have caused to others and to ourselves. Making amends is an important part of forgiveness. As we begin to gain clarity about the harm we caused in our addiction, we commit to make amends for that harmful behavior. We don't make amends for the sake of satisfying some external standard of morality to be forgiven or to get something in return. Instead, we use the process as a way to let go of our expectations and disappointments in others and ourselves, in other words, to let go of our attachment to a different past. One of the central principles of karma is realizing that I alone am responsible for the way my past actions impact my current responses to the world. We change our habits by letting go of the past and restoring, balancing our relationships. Things we did in the past create patterns of behavior that continue to shape our thoughts and intentions in the present. That process doesn't stop until we change our relationship with those patterns and toward the people we've harmed. Amends are about Restoring the balance in our relationships, not about asking for forgive. Dash. Ness from others. In a sense, it is an action we take to forgive ourselves. When we have come to understand and face the reality of our impact on others, we begin to understand the purpose of making amends. Practicing compassion leads to a desire to relieve the suffering of people we've harmed, and a commitment to not cause further suffer. Dash. In. Even if the person isn't a part of our lives any longer, it's possible to acknowledge their hurt and to offer them our goodwill and our remorse. Making amends means we do what we can to remedy the harm or wrong. If that is not possible, we resolve to do some good, not as compensation, but to develop our habits in a different direction. When we intention, dash, ally take responsibility for our actions, we let go of harmful avoidance and self-judgment and develop a sense of connectedness, peace, and ease. Amends begin with a willingness to forgive ourselves and take the path of reconciliation, not only with those we have harmed, but also with our own hearts and minds. Generosity, compassion, loving-kindness, and forgiveness allow as to experience equanimity as we face pain and discomfort, both in ourselves and others. The fourth heart practice is equanimity. Dot, during our addictions, we often responded to situations that caused us anger, fear, or resentment with a craving that the situations be different. We gave up and surrender to the negative experience of life. Equanimity does not mean giving up, it is more a quality of leaning in. It is finding peace exactly where we are, regardless of external circumstances. Equanimity allows us to be right in the middle of things, to understand and accept 
things as they are without needing to escape. When we gave up, we said, I don't care what happens. Equanimity, on the other hand, is being able to say, I can be present for this. It's the acceptance that while there are some things we cannot change, we still have power over how we respond to them, while we don't always have control over our thoughts and feel. Dash. Ings, we do have power over how we feed them. Inquiry of wise intention. Colon. What compassion or forgiveness can you offer when someone's in? Dash. Tension is good but their impact is harmful. If it doesn't feel safe or appropriate to offer this directly to the person, how can you bring that forgiveness into your own heart so you don't have the burden of carrying it? During your periods of addictive behavior, how did you act in ways that were clinging, uncaring, harsh, cruel, or unforgiving? 2. Dash. Lord whom, including yourself, were these feelings directed? How? Might generosity, compassion, loving kindness, and forgiveness have changed your behavior? What actions have you taken that have harmed others? Have you formed an intention to reconcile with both yourself and the person or people you've harmed to make amends? If so, have you found a wise friend or mentor you can go to for guidance and support in the amends process, which is summarized below? What support can this person provide as you begin the process of amends? Making amends. Have you done something intentionally that you now recognize? Caused harm to another, who has been harmed by your actions? Have you honestly formed the intention not to repeat harmful AC? Dash. Try on and to learn from the experience in future interactions. Path. You begun the process of directly addressing the harmful actions of your past. Making amends depends on the circumstance, including your press, dash, and relationship to the person and the extent to which you can undo the harm caused through direct actions, like correcting a public diss, dash, honesty or compensating another for things you have taken that were not freely offered. Ask yourself, what can I do in the present? Can you address and reconcile with the harm you have caused with? Dash. Outforming an attachment to being forgiven. Identify the motive of. Dash. T on for making each amends. What actions would restore balance in your own feelings and AP? Dash. Approach to whatever harm you have caused. Can these steps be taken? without causing new harm to the person or the relationship. If you're experiencing a difficult situation or choice in your life right now, investigate the intention you are bringing to this situation. 1. Are you being selfish or self-seeking? How? 2. Are you being driven by aversion, running away from an unpleasant? Experience are craving, grasping for pleasure. How? 3. How could you bring in a spirit of generosity, compassion, loving care, dash, inness, appreciative joy, and forgiveness to this situation? 4. How would this situation look different if you brought these factors to mind before reacting or responding? 5. If you don't want to, can you at least have the intention and willing? Dash. Nest to do so. Why speak?
Why speech is based on the intention to do no harm. You God. Use speech in a manner that may create harm. Lying to think others from. Knowing what's really going on. Gossiping with the intention of putting. Someone down or satisfying our desire to be recognized. Stealing time. And attention by chattering on and on, or trying to convince others to leave our own needs at the expense of their own. While speech includes all the ways we use our voices, including online and in writing. The basic foundation of wise speech is honesty or truthfulness. Dishonesty is exaggeration. Minimizing, omitting or lying or deleting. Dash. Tension of presenting a distortion of reality. It can take the form of, white Lies. To avoid embarrassment or exposure. Half truths to keep from being. Caught. Or seemingly harmless things said at the expense of others. We may say more than we really know to be true in the hopes of appearing smarter or more confident in our position or feeling sometimes we say something before we know the truth dishonesty has to do with our intention in speech are we noble that baited by greed fear or confusion or are we motivated by a sincere desire to express what's true, what's useful, what's kind, and what's timely. Why? Speech means we speak with the intention of not causing harm, and of fostering safety and security in our community. In active addiction, we develop a habit of dishonesty. We lie. To cover up or mislead others about the nature and extent of our using or behavior. We lie so we can satisfy the craving our fixation feeds by hiding our actions, our feelings, or the amount of money and effort we put into satisfying our craving. Many of us lie just for the sake of lying because that Truth represents a reality we can't tolerate. We get trapped by our secrets. And for many of us, having a double life becomes an addiction all its own. This is why honesty is foundational to recovery. Dishonesty is one of us. Habits that allow our addictive behaviors to flourish. As a result, recovery needs to start with an honest appraisal of exactly what lies we told them. What dishonesty we spread during our addictive behavior. The data provided some guidelines for wise speech, in ad. Dash. Addition to truthfulness. He said to avoid slander and gossip, recognizing that such unwise speech causes conflict and makes the community less. Safe. So, when we talk about others, we can ask ourselves, what's our intention? Is it to cause division or exclusion? Is it to cause shame or end? Dash. Embarrassment in someone else, or to somehow make ourselves look better. At somebody else's expense, it's possible to talk about other people with the intention of kindness, generosity, and compassion, to seek under death, standing or support for another. Gossip and slander do not contribute to this and instead, cause harm. Similarly, idle chatter and saying things just to be heard or recognized, or to take up time when you're uncomfortable can lead people to dismiss or ignore us and may create impatience and intolerance in our community. Wise speech is also reflected in a tone we use when we talk. 
If we express ourselves in harsh, angry, or abusive ways, we may not be heard even if we're being truthful, speaking gently, with the intention of kindness, fosters a community of friendliness and safety. There are always exceptions, of course, and wise speech also includes using a loud and strong voice when you need to protect your safety. It may sound like wise speech is primarily about discerning when not to speak, but this isn't always the case. Many of us grew up in families where it wasn't safe to talk openly about our thoughts and feelings. Some, because of certain experiences or cultural conditioning, have been taught that we don't have permission to use our voices or lack the power to speak and be heard. For many of us, practicing wise speech may mean learning how to use our voices that have been silenced, and to wisely communicate the needs and boundaries we've gotten used to keep. Yeah. In hidden, at times, this includes speaking up for others when harm is done. Many of us, in an effort to be light, for fear of locking the boat, or due to the exhaustion of repeatedly not being seen and heard, have favored being nice over being honest and true to ourselves. Wise speech teaches us that speaking up, even when it's hard, is sometimes the best choice, and that speech is never truly kind if we cause harm to ourselves. Finally, wise speech is careful listening. Dot, it is also knowing when not to speak when a wise response isn't available to us. We must listen with compassion, understanding, and receptivity. It can be really helpful to observe how much of the time we spend listening to someone else. It actually stops judging them or planning what we're going to say in response. Deep listening, without selfishness, or an agenda, is an act of generosity that lets us build true connection. Inquiry of wise speech. Colon. Have you caused harm with your speech? How? Have you been dishonest or harsh in your communication? When? And in what specific ways? Do you use speech now to hurt or control people, to prevent a false idea or image of yourself or of reality, to demand attention, or to relieve the discomfort of silence? Detail specific instances in which you used speech to mislead, misdirect, or distract. Are you careful to avoid causing harm with your speech? Do you say things you know are not true, or pretend to know the truth about something when you don't, to appear more knowledge, that able or credible than you are? List some examples. Wise action. Wise action is also based in the intention to do no harm and to foster compassion, loving kindness, generosity, and forgiveness. We try to do what's skillful and avoid actions that are unskillful. Wise action asks that we try to make choices based on understanding and not on thinking. Habits are ignorant. The Buddha suggested that we make a commitment to avoid five specific actions that cause harm, a commitment which is known as the five precepts. We commit to the five precepts as our basic ethical system. One. We set the intention to avoid taking the life of another living being or from causing harm to ourselves or another living being. 
choose. Use that name to enter a void token that is not freely given or stealing. Three. Reset the intention to avoid causing harm through our sexual calm. Dash. Duck. And to be aware of the consequences and impact of our sexual activity and desire. Four. Reset the intention of being honest, of not lying, and of not using speech in a harmful way. Five. We set the intention to avoid the use of intoxicants and intoxicating behavior that cloud our awareness. We need to continually reflect on and question the intentions behind our actions. We may have moments of clarity, but these can quickly pass when old habits are caught resurface. We commit to calm, gas, Gently reminding ourselves of our intention to wise actions, to act in ways that are non-harming. Inquiry of wise actions. Four. Have you acted in a way that was unskillful or that created suffering? How? During those times you were unskillful or created suffering, how? Would it have changed the outcome if you had acted out of home? Dad. Passion, kindness, generosity, and forgiveness. Would you now have a different emotional or mental response to your past actions if you had acted with these principles in mind? First precept. That you caused harm. How? Allow for a broad understanding of harm, including physical, emotional, mental, and karmic harm, such as financial, legal, moral, microaggressions, or any of the isms, and phobias such as racism, sexism, ableism, classism, homophobia. Transphobia, etc. Even if you can't point to specific harm that you have caused, past, you acted in a way that purposely avoided being aware of the proceeds. Dash. Ability of harm. Second precept. People, take, in many ways, you take good or material possessions. We take time and energy, we take care and recognition. With this, broad understanding of taking, have you taken what has not been freely given? How? What are specific examples or patterns where they has been true for you? Third precept. Have you behaved irresponsibly, selfishly, or without full consent in Awareness from yourself or partners in your sexual conduct. How? Reviewing your sexual partners or activities. Have you been fully aware in each instance of other existing relationships, prior or current? Dad. Rent mental or emotional conditions of yourself and your partners. And your own intentions in becoming sexually involved. How or how not? Has your sexual activity, both by yourself and with others, been based on non-harmful intentions? Have you entered into each sexual dash? How activity with awareness and understanding? How or how not? Fourth precept. Have you been dishonest? How?
Archipelago. 1918-1956. An experiment in literary investigation. 1-2. Translated from the Russian by Thomas P. Whitney. Harper and Rowe, Publishers. New York, Evanston, San Francisco, London. PDF today. 1817. I dedicate this to all those who will not live to tell it. And may they please forgive me for not having seen it all nor remembered it all, for not having divined all of it. Author's Notes For years I have with reluctant heart withheld from publication this already completed book. My obligation to those still living outweighs my obligation to the dead. But now that state security has seized the book anyway, I have no alternative but to publish it immediately. In this book there are no fictitious persons, nor fictitious events. People and places are named with their own names. If they are identified by initials instead of names, it is for personal considerations. If they are not named at all, it is only because human memory has failed to preserve their names. But it all took place just as it is here described. Content. Preface. Part 1 The Prison Industry. 1. Arrest. 2. The history of our school disposal system. 3. The interrogation. 4. The blue tax. 5. First cell. First love. 6. Bad spring. 7. In the engine room. 8. The law of the child. 9. The law becomes a man. 10. The law matures. 11. The supreme measure. 12. Higher that. Part 2 Perpetual Motion. 1. The ship of the archipelago. 6. 3. 24. 93. 144. 179. 237. 277. 299. 334. 371. 432. 456. 489. B. B. Content. 2. The Ports of the Archipelago 3. The Slave Caravan of Pearl. From Island to Island. Translators Notes Glossary. Names Institutions and Terms Index. Bill U.S. Trations. Page 2. Alexander Isaevich Solzhenitsyn in the army in detention after his release from camp. Page 488 Viktor Petrovich Podkovsky Alexander Strobinder Vasily Ivanovich Anichkov Alexander Andreevich Stephen Mikhail Alexander the three formats the Yelizaveta Yevgenyevna Anichkova. 533,565,558 Preface In 1949 some friends and I came upon a noteworthy news item in nature, a message in the Academy of Sciences. It reported in tiny type that in the course of excavations on the Kurima River a subterranean ice lens had been discovered which was actually a frozen stream and in it were found frozen specimens of prehistoric fauna some tens of thousands of years old. Whether fish or salamander, these were preserved in so fresh a state, the scientific correspondent reported that those present immediately broke open the ice encasing the specimens and devoured them with relish on the spot. 
the magazine no doubt astonished its small audience with the news that how successfully the flesh of fish could be kept fresh in a frozen state. The few, indeed, among its readers were able to decipher the genuine and heroic meaning of this impartial report. As for us, however we understood instantly. We could picture the entire scene right down to the smallest detail. How those present broke up the ice in frenzied haste. How, clouding the higher planes of ichthyology and elbowing each other to be first, they tore off chunks of the prehistoric flesh and hauled them over to the bonfire to thaw them out and bolt them down. We understood that the beat ourselves were the same kind of people as those present at that event. We, too, were from that powerful tribe of Zex, unique on the face of the earth, the only people who could devour prehistoric salamander with relish. And that the moon was the greatest and most famous island, just six, six, five, seven. Full of ferocity of that amazing country of Gulag which, though scattered in an archipelago geographically, was, in the psychological sense, fused into a continent and almost invisible, almost imperceptible country inhabited by the Zek people. And this archipelago crisscrossed and patterned that other country within which it was located, like a gigantic patchwork, going into its city, towering over its streets. Yet there were many who did not even guess at its presence and many, many others who had heard something vague. And only those who had been there knew the whole truth. But, as those stricken dumb on the islands of the archipelago, they kept their silence. By an unexpected tone of odd history, a bit of the truth, an insignificant part of the whole, was allowed out in the open. But those same hands which once screwed tight our handcuffs now hold out their palms in reconciliation. No, don't. Don't wake up the past. Well on the past and you lose an eye. But the proverb goes on to say, forget the past and you lose both eyes. Decades go by, and the scars and sores of the past are healing over for good. In the course of this period some of the islands of the archipelago have shuddered and dissolved in the polar sea of oblivion rolls over them. And someday in the future, this archipelago, its air, and the bones of its inhabitants, frozen in the lens of ice, will be discovered by our descendants right from the tropical salamander. I would not be so bold as to try to write the history of the archipelago. I have never had the chance to read the documents. And, in fact, will anyone ever have the chance to read them? Those who do not wish to recall have already had enough time and will have more to destroy all the documents, down to the very last one. I have absorbed into myself my own 11 years there not as something shameful nor as a nightmare to be sure. I have come almost to love that monstrous world, and now, by a happy tongue of events, I have also been entrusted with many recent reports and letters. So perhaps I shall be able to take some account of the bones and flesh of that salamander which, incidentally, is still alive. Three days. I. She. This book could never have been created by one person alone. In addition to what I myself was able to take away from the archipelago on the skin of my back, and with my eyes and ears material for this book was given me in reports, memoirs, and letters by 227 witnesses, whose names were to have been listed here. What I here express to them is not personal gratitude, because this is our common, collective monument to all those who were tortured and murdered. From among them 
I would like to point it out in particular those who worked hard to help me obtain supporting bibliographical material from books to be found in contemporary libraries or from books long since removed from libraries and destroyed. Great persistence was often required to find even one copy which had been preserved. Even more would I like to pay tribute to those who helped me keep this manuscript concealed in difficult periods and then to have it copied. But the time has not yet come when I dare name them. The old Solovetsky Islands prisoner Dmitry Petrovich Vitkovsky was to have been editor of this book. I did have a lifetime spent there indeed. His own hand memoirs are entitled, Half a Lifetime, resulted in untimely paralysis, and it was not until after he had already been deprived of the gift of speech that he was able to read several completed chapters only and see for himself that everything will be told. She, I, nothing. And this freedom still does not dawn on my country for a long time to come. Then the very reading and handing on of this book will be very dangerous, so that I am bound to salute future readers as well, on behalf of those who have perished. When I began to write this book in 1958, I knew of no memoirs nor works of literature dealing with the hand. During my years of work before 1967 I gradually became acquainted with the Kalima stories of Varlam Shalomov and the memoirs of Dmitry. Vitkovsky, Y, Ginsburg, and O, Adam of Oswiatsburg, to which I refer in the course of my narrative as literary facts known to all, as indeed they someday shall be. Despite their intention against their will, Certain persons provided invaluable material for this book and helped preserve many important facts and statistics as well as the very air they breathe. And I, Kudrav Vlatsis, and B. Filenko, the chief state prosecutor for many years, is there a Y. Vyshinsky, and those jurists who were his accomplices, among whom one must single out in particular I. L. A verdict. Material for this book was also provided by 36 Soviet writers, headed by Maxim Gorky, authors of the disgraceful book on the white seeking out, which was the first in Russian literature to glorify slave labor. Part 1. The Prison Industry In the period of dictatorship, surrounded on all sides by enemies, you sometimes manifested unnecessary leniency and unnecessary soft-heartedness. K-R-Y-L-E-N-K-O Speech at the Primparty Trial Alexander Zvedevich Solzhenitsyn in the army In detention after his release from camp. Chapter 1. Arrest. How do people get to this clandestine archipelago? Hour by hour planes fly there, ships steer their course there, and trains thunder off to it but all with nary a mark on them to tell of their destination. And of ticket windows are at travel bureaus for Soviet or foreign tourists who in Soviet would be astounded if you were to ask for a ticket to go there. They know nothing and they've never heard of the archipelago as a whole or of any one of its innumerable islands. Those who go to the archipelago to administer it get there via the training schools of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Those who go there to be guards are conscripted via the military conscription centers. And those who, like you and me, dear reader, go there to die, must get there solely and compulsorily via arrest. Arrest. Need it be said that it is a breaking point in your life, a bolt of lightning which has scored a direct hit on you. That it is an unattainable spiritual earthquake not every person can cope with, as a result of which people often fall into insanity. 
the universe has as many different centers as there are living beings in it. Each of us is a center of the universe, and that universe is scattered when they disappear. You are under arrest. If you are arrested, can anything else remain unshattered by this cataclysm? But the dark and mind is incapable of embracing these displacements in our universe, and both the most sophisticated and 3, 4, 5, the Gulag Archipelago. The various simpleton among us, drawing on all life's experience, can gasp out only, me. What for? And this is a question which, though repeated millions and millions of times before, has yet to our tilde see an answer. Arrest is an instantaneous, shattering thrust, expulsion, somersault from one state into another. We have been happily born but perhaps have unhappily dragged our weary way down the long and crooked streets of our lives, past all kinds of walls and fences made of rotting wood, land earth, brick, concrete, iron railings. We have never given all thought to what lies behind them. We have never tried to penetrate them with our vision or our understanding. But there is where the Gulag country begins, right next to us, two yards away from us. In addition, we have failed to notice an enormous number of closely fitted, well-disguised doors and gates in these fences. All those gates were prepared for us, every last one. And all of a sudden the gates are big time, quickly open, and four white male hands, unaccustomed to physical labor but nonetheless strong and tenacious, grab us by the leg, arm, collar, hat, heel, and drag us in like a sack, and the gate behind us, the gate to our past life, is slammed shut once and for all. That's all there is to it. You were arrested, and you'll find nothing better to respond with than a lamb-like plea. Me. What for? That's what arrest is. It's a blinding flash and a blow which shifts the present instantly into the past and the impossible into omnipotent actuality. That's all. And neither for the first hour nor for the first day will you be able to grasp anything else. Except that in your desperation the fake circus moon you're getting to do. It's a mistake. They'll set things right. And everything which is by now comprised in the traditional, even literary, image of an arrest will pile up and take shape, not in your own disordered memory, but in what your family and your neighbors in your apartment remember, the sharp nighttime ring or the rude knock at the door. You wait for an entrance of the unlike jackboots of the unsleeping state security operatives. The frightened and cowed civilian witness at their back. And what function does this civilian witness serve? The victim doesn't even dare think about it when the operatives don't remain. Arrest I-5. He is, but that's what the regulations call for, and so he has to sit there all night long and sign in the morning point one for the witness. Jerk from his bed, it is torture too to go out night after night to help arrest his own neighbors and acquaintances. The traditional image of arrest is also trembling hands packing for the victim a change of underwear, a piece of soap, something to eat, and no one knows what is needed, what is permitted, what clothes are best to wear, and the security agents keep in. Corrupting and hurrying you, you don't need anything. They'll feed you there, it's warm there, it's all lies. They keep hurrying you to frighten you. The traditional image of arrest is also what happens afterward, when the poor victim has been taken away. It is an alien, brutal, and crushing force totally dominating the apartment for hours on. A breaking, ripping open, pulling from the wall, 
Lifting things from wardrobes and desks onto the floor, shaking, jumping out, and ripping apart piling up mountains of litter on the floor. And the crunch of things being trampled beneath jackboots. And nothing is sacred in the surf. During the arrest of the locomotive engineer in Ocean, a tiny coffin stood in his room considering the body of his newly dead child. The jurist dumped the child's body out of the coffin and searched it. They shake sick people out of their sick beds, and they unwind bandages to search beneath them. Point two. Doc. Nothing is so stupid as to be inadmissible during a search. For example, they seized from the antiquarian Chetrogen a certain number of pages of Sardis decree, to wit, the decree on ending the war with Napoleon, on the formation of the Holy Alliance, and a proclamation of public prayers against cholera during the epidemic of 1830. From our greatest expert on Tibet, Bas Vata, they confiscated ancient Tibetan manuscripts of great value, and it took the people to the deceased scholar 30 years to wrest them from the KGB. Way of Oriental it must be was. 1. The regulation, purposeless in itself, derives, and, and, recalls, from that, strange time when the citizenry not only was supposed to but actually dared to verify the actions of the police. 2. When in 1937 they wiped out Dry, Kazakov's Institute, the Commission broke up the jars containing the lice sales developed by him, even though patients who had been cured and others still being treated rushed around them, begging them to preserve the miraculous medicine. According to the official version, the lice states were supposed to be poisoned. In that case, why should they not have been kept as material evidence? Six. I, the Gulag Archipelago, arrested, they grabbed Tangit manuscripts and 25 years later the deceased victim was posthumously awarded a Lenin Prize for deciphering them. From Carter they took his archive of the Minise Ostiaks and vetoed the alphabet and vocabulary he had developed for this people in a small nationality was thereby left without any written language. It would take a long time to describe all this in educated speech, but there's a folk saying about the search which covers the subject. They are looking for something which was never put there. They carry off whatever they have seized, but sometimes they compel the arrested individual to carry it. Thus Nina Alexandrovna Kalchinskaya hauled over her shoulder a bag filled with the papers and letters of her eternally busy and active husband, the late great Russian engineer, carrying it into their mall, once and for all, forever. For those left behind after the arrest there is the long tail end of a wreck and devastated life, and he attempts to go and deliver food parcels. But from all